Uh, so, hi, I'm Abby Palmer. I work for MSU Extension and I'm stationed at the Upper Peninsula Research and Extension Center in Chatham. Uh, my role is to help uh, mostly educators uh, bring agriculture, food, and natural resources learning activities into their classrooms. And uh, as a result of that, I have had the opportunity to learn about seeds. Uh, I'm involved in a couple different seed saving programs and activities. Um, and uh, today we're going to delve into the art and practice of seed saving. We're going to look at uh, some examples of different seeds and how to process them, but we're also going to talk about how to read your garden so that you can sort of interpret how might I save seeds from this plant? Where might I begin? So today's just kind of a little like opening the door on the world of seed saving. And I'm going to share screen. We're going to start with a little bit of information about the farm where I work so that you guys understand what all might be available through extension to support your seed saving activities and your agriculture concerns or your gardening uh, interests. Uh, so the UP Research and Extension Center is in Chatham. We are one of 14 different research and extension centers around the state. We are the oldest, uh, which was founded in 1899. We have two farm sites uh, people might be more familiar with the name the North Farm uh, and seeing those white barns on the hill in Chatham. Uh, the South Farm was built in 1985, uh, just south of Chatham. They kind of bookend the town uh, in order to do dairy research. And, you know, these facilities have changed um, with their research interests over time. And so now uh, we study how beef cattle perform in the Upper Peninsula, specifically uh, grass-finished or grass-fed beef. Uh, we have a grazing program where the cows are rotated through different pastures every day. And we're looking at grazing impacts and soil health and that work. Uh, we also study, you know, we're a research farm. We study agronomy, the science of agriculture. So small grains such as barley, how does barley perform in the Upper Peninsula? Uh, how do cover crops improve soil health? Um, we've got a bunch of different research projects there. In fact, that's not even all listed. We also do stuff with alfalfa, etc. cetera. Uh, at the North Farm, we study organic specialty crops. That facility is certified organic and we grow vegetables uh, in trial. So we might grow like 10 varieties of a pepper in our hoop house and we wanna see which one performs the best. Uh, one of the projects we're working on right now has chefs taste that vegetable and then we combine which vegetables perform the best and overlay the data set of what chefs liked uh, and then can share that with other farms who might be trying to decide, well, what should I grow? What will perform well here and what will go to market? Uh, we also have research that's about uh, studying the effects of climate change on crops and hemp, both for CBD, fiber, and uh, grain, like seeds. Um, and, you know, the final research area I want to talk to you about, this is kind of where seed saving uh, might fit in, is thinking about our next generation of farmers. Uh, we have a farm business incubator that is a way for people to rent land if they don't have access to maybe generational land for farming uh, to start their farm business with some kind of assets that we have at the, at the farm to share, uh, such as equipment, and uh, irrigation and hoop houses, et cetera. The land-based learning piece of this, so working with youth on activities like seed saving, answering questions like where does food come from? How is it produced? That's, uh, that's sort of my research area. And I have at the farm a seed saving garden, which is where uh, groups of kids school-age kids, uh, maybe even grown-up kids, can interact with the plants and learn about seed saving. So that's where some of my knowledge about seed saving has been derived, is from just working with other people uh, in that space and in their own gardens. Um, so yeah, think of the UP Research and Extension Center as a place where you can ask for presentations about our research, come for a farm tour, internships, um, and if you know teachers who want to do more with agriculture in their classrooms, uh, we can support that as well. 
So that's that's a uh, you know kind of the the canned spiel about MSU. We're going to deviate from that now, and we're going to get into some talk about seed saving. I have been fortunate to have amazing teachers, people who were interested in plants themselves and who spent time with me in their gardens, um, showing me how to read the plants and how to save seeds. And, uh, you know, I would like to thank those teachers right now uh, to call them into the room and to acknowledge that their knowledge is in great part the basis of everything I'm going to share with you. The seed saving has a lot of innovation. You can combine, you can create, but it's also a very, very ancient thing. And I'm not sure how much is truly new in it, except that every generation of the plants is new. Um, <clears throat> so personal reflection time, let's just take a minute and get grounded in this idea. What is a seed? And if you'd like to unmute, uh, you can. If you'd like to type it in the chat, you can. I'm going to give everybody 60 seconds to just think quietly about what is a seed. And then we'll come back together and uh, think about that, talk about it. So what do you think? What came up for you when you just asked yourself, what is a seed? Oh my gosh, for me, it's life. It's how life just keeps continuing. And sometimes you don't have to do anything for it to happen. It just miraculously happens. And um, it's to me, what is a seed? It's life. I think the seed is a representative of the being that created it and, and, and ready to be, you know, optimized. Um, if fertilized and taken care of. Yeah. Yeah, a seed represents potential, but there are a lot of unknowns, right? It, it takes the right circumstances for the seed to continue. Yeah. Yeah, Emily's got, uh, she's affirming that this makes sense to her. She's saying, yes, life and potential. It's a uh, potential in that, you know, the seed, two seeds could be, look exactly the same, but result in very different plants. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the seed itself, but I think a lot more of it has to do with the environment that it is exposed to after that. Yes, yes. There's all this potential, all this genetic potential in the seed, and then how the environment impacts that plant tells you, or, or I should say, affects which genes the plant expresses, right? And so it can really affect what your plant actually ends up looking like. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, we have all kinds of metaphors, you know, to plant a seed is to begin a process um, to, uh, you know, I, <clears throat> when I think about seeds, I think about an unspooling. There is a quote, I think it's attributed to Aristotle, uh, something like, 
um, the mightiest oak tree is contained inside each acorn. Um, seeds are something where we start really small uh, and such unexpected and interesting and beautiful things come out of them. Um, yeah, so when we get to play with seeds later, that will uh, kind, kind of be an important part for, for me. Uh, now I'm going to send you on a mission. I know this is a virtual uh, setting and so many people are in their homes. I'm gonna give you a minute to find the closest seed to where you are now. It may be in the decor, it may be in the kitchen. Um, if you have your seed saving kit, that doesn't count. You have to find another seed in your house. Uh, so it's 1120, uh, I give you a minute to find the nearest seed to where you are sitting right now. Okie dokie. You may be saying, but a minute isn't very long. How can I only have a minute to find a seed? But my question is, did people find seeds? I'll share mine first. Seeds are really all around us. Um, this is a safflower seed. It is from my parrot's food. I share her cages right next to me and she eats seeds and actually so do I. Um, I could have grabbed a loaf of bread and that would also be a seed. What did other people find? I have a vase of flowers. That he brought for the event. <laughs> uh, I, I, was, I was looking around uh, and then I realized that right beyond the vase of flowers, my husband has two packets of seeds that are, you know, the ones you buy, the burpees, the sugar daddy peas. And he didn't plant them. I don't know why they're sitting there, but that's where our seeds are. I'm sitting there for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you got some seeds nearby and they're ready. They're ready. They, they, could, they could still go out if they wanted to. Did anybody else find a seed nearby? I thought I had and I was looking at it and I dropped it. I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> Was it like, cause seeds sometimes just get tracked into a room on people's shoes or on their clothes. Um, I've had people reach down and, you know, grab a burr off of their pants and say, well, I guess I found my seed because they, they'll travel with us. They right. really do not only in our pockets when we intentionally bring them places, but they travel all over on anything that has legs or wings. Yeah, yeah I had picked it off my laundry. I found some towels outside somebody just sat outside so I was like oh but they were covered in a lot of organic matter <laughs> <laughs> I like that phrase organic matter right. and it looks like Emily found a kiwi which of course has seeds in it we eat uh, so much of what we eat it is not just a seed itself like flour or comes from a seed like a tomato but even the meat that we eat depends on seeds to grow the food for those animals. So we're pretty deep in it with seeds. We have a long relationship with seeds, humans, humans do. Um, let's see. All right, so now that, now that we, we've kind of gone inside and thought about seeds and kind of looked around and seen how important seeds are in our lives, I wanna talk just a little bit about the Queen City Seed Library, and then we're gonna jump into uh, some practices and some um, approaches to seed saving. So 
The Queen City Seed Library is located on the main floor of the Peter White Public Library in Marquette. And this is a community resource that's completely free and open to anyone. Uh, we try to host seed swaps in the fall or in the spring, uh, which can be a good place to bring seeds, uh, a good place to get seeds because you don't have to have seeds to offer to participate. And it's also a really good place to meet other people interested in seed saving and just have conversations about how did things do in your garden this year? Why did you bring this seed? Uh, you know, is this good for food? Is it good for dying? How do I save it? Uh, there's so many cool conversations that can happen at a seed swap. So I would invite you all to participate. I'm not sure when our next one is going to be because, you know, the pandemic kind of threw things off. We tried virtual. Uh, I think we're going to be looking forward to going back to in person probably in March of 22. Um, but in the meantime, the seed library is stocked. Uh, with seeds that are both derived from seed companies that will send us their extras and also from seeds saved by community members. And when you save seeds, when community members save seeds from this place, those plants have adapted to our climate, our growing season, our soil conditions, and also to our tastes and interests. Those plants come to represent this place. Uh, and that is such a special thing about a seed library is that you know when people are saving seeds themselves and contributing them and sharing them we are creating a language of place through plants that we it, it makes our food system more resilient right we're not depending on seeds from elsewhere from plants that are adapted to other conditions we've got the seeds that grow well here so that's you know, the inspiration to try to get people to save seeds, but you should never feel bad if you try to save seeds and it doesn't go right. It's just, it's really more about the trying, you know, that's the fun part. And the plants themselves are so generous. They create so many seeds that we often have more seeds than we can get out in a, in a given year, right? We always have backstock of seeds. So, you know, if you use the seed library, uh, give, a, give seed saving a chance, but don't feel bad if it doesn't work out and do feel free to uh, ask questions at queencityseedlibrary at gmail.com and uh, we'll connect you with other seed savers in the area who might be able to answer your questions. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to share a different presentation now. And you'll forgive me for not going into big presentation mode. I will make it as big as I can, but I have screen issues. So let's get into some of the meat of it. What are some of the approaches to seed saving? Have you ever thought about how different people might have different attitudes toward saving seeds and different reasons for doing so? I'm gonna pause here and ask you to think, what is the reason that you are interested in saving seeds? And Jonathan, we remember that you shared your reason, you know, which had to do with wanting to understand them better so that, you know, you can uh, work on your compost thing. But yeah, does anyone have anything they'd like to share about why you are interested in saving seeds? I'm really interested in um, self-sufficiency uh, and being able to feed my family over and over again with the seeds that are already coming out of the garden. One, financially, you save a little bit of money. You don't have to go to the store to buy your seeds, but you're also not dependent on the store to buy your seeds. So it's like a, a knowledge of empowerment to be able to use these gifts that are given freely, but know how to use them. And I feel like it's a, lot, a knowledge that's been lost. So I'd like to reclaim that knowledge to feed my family for generations. <laughs> Mm, yes, thank you. I think for me now, it's mostly informational out of just some interest uh, as I'm, you know, I'm not gardening anymore, but uh, I do have, if, if I have the knowledge, I have a lot of close friends who are serious gardeners and uh, I plan to share whatever I take away from here. Yeah, the ripple effect. Awesome. Yes. Mm. Mm. 
you know, I think that those those reasons of wanting self sufficiency, wanting financial, uh, you know, wanting wanting to have something maybe happening outside of the system of money, uh, a kind of uh, self sufficiency that depends only on one's relationship with the land and not on having to continually purchase in from outside. I think that those are big reasons for people. Um, for me personally, I am simply fascinated by all the different ways that plants make seeds. I find it so beautiful and such a satisfying thing to see the whole process, uh, to see a full circle, to take a plant from a seed I saved through its life cycle back to a seed that I could plant again that sort of fills me with a some kind of peace to be able to complete that. Even though, like you said, it's a lot of work to process the seeds. <laughs> and sometimes, uh, anyway, uh, I've got bags and bags of seeds, I guess is the point of that. There are a couple different approaches towards seed saving that I want to let you know about in case you want to follow some of these folks and read more about how and why. Um, so Rowan White uh, is working with the, uh, I think it's the Native American Seed Alliance. Uh, she may, may still be with Sierra Seeds, but she writes a lot about rematriation. She saves seeds because they are part of the food of her people and some of the activities that she wants to do with seeds. And uh, Shiloh Maples is another person based in Michigan associated with the same organization. Uh, they're looking at how to increase food security and food sovereignty in indigenous communities through seeds, um, but particularly through going and having relationships with the seed banks and the universities that have some seeds that their communities no longer have. And some of those seeds were shared out, um, you know, and others were just ended up in these seed libraries, I mean, these uh, sort of seed vaults, if you will. And so trying to go through the process of getting access to those seeds and returning them uh, to people who will grow them in the places that they were raised and by the people who originally developed those seeds. Um, another attitude towards seed saving or another reason that some people seed save is uh, apocalyptic recovery, right? Thinking about a catastrophe in the food system uh, or a catastrophe having to do with climate and asking how would we restart, how, where would we begin? Uh, so the Svalbard Global Seed Vault is in, I think it's in Sweden. And oddly enough, there's a weird connection to Marquette because the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, which takes seeds from all over the world and is below permafrost, et cetera, uh, is on an island called Longyearbyen. Longyear, yes, owned by the very same John Longyear, whose you know, name is on roads and he was a forester and landlooker, well, forester? I don't know what the word is exactly, but you know, he was a landlooker and property owner here. And he bought a coal mine that was on this island. Uh, and this is where the seed vault is. So whenever the seed vault makes the news, I think of that weird little Marquette connection. Uh, another attitude towards seed saving is the participatory preservation of rare varieties. And this would be exemplified by Seed Savers Exchange. They have a beautiful catalog. Maybe you've seen it. Um, the idea here is that like, say there's a Nebraska wedding tomato, which is given by like a mother-in-law to her new daughter-in-law. The Seed Savers Exchange wants to preserve that seed variety exactly. They want to keep the history and the story alive by saving the seed and continuing to tell the story. Uh, and everybody can get involved in that. Seed Savers Exchange is a cooperative and uh, there's the catalog where they sell stuff. That's how they support their nonprofit. But there's also uh, just a exchange between all kinds of seed savers that they've facilitated for, gosh, probably 40 years. That's so kind of a different catalog. And so everybody who wants to get involved in that is trying to get involved in that. And they are trying to keep those varieties the same from year to year. The last attitude towards seed saving that I want to showcase today, and there's more even than this, is Joseph Lofthouse. Uh, he's a seed saver and seed breeder in Idaho. And he's interested in the land race uh, approach. So Lofthouse would say, I would like 
a melon. And I live at kind of a high altitude and I have kind of a short growing season. So I'm going to take 20 kinds of melon seed. I'm gonna plant them all and I'm gonna let those plants cross pollinate. And then I'm going to begin selecting from there uh, the plants that have the qualities that I'm looking for. So short season and flavor. Uh, and so not only is he developing new types, he's also not particularly concerned about stabilizing those types. There ends up being a lot of genetic variation when you just let things cross pollinate. This is the opposite of the participatory preservation of rare varieties. This is saying, uh, I'm gonna let go of the story and I'm gonna let the plants and their genetics grow and adapt to this place. And I'm going to encourage them to cross pollinate. Uh, I felt that this last attitude really freed me up in terms of my own fear about not saving seeds correctly, stopping me from even trying or trying hard things because I was like, oh, if I mess it up, then I'm going to lose the Nebraska wedding tomato. And then, and then, well, turns out there's another approach, which is uh, allow the seeds to cross and select what you want from there. So I, I kind of like that approach. His book is coming out and I am going to be excited to, to, to check that out. All right, we're going to do some easy seed saving. How to read your garden for seed saving. This is about getting to know your plants a little bit uh, so that you can decide which ones will work for you for seed saving. The first thing we're going to talk about is family, right? Plants have families. Like, uh, did you know that Brussels sprouts and kale are in the same family? They are related. They have similar characteristics. Knowing plant families can really help you with seed saving because uh, different families, the rules are apply. So the same rules apply in that brassica family that has kale and Brussels sprouts. There are different rules for onions and garlic. Well, they're in a different family. But uh, by learning the families, you can simplify uh, and reduce the number of times you have to repeat, like, well, how do I save seed from this specific thing? We're also going to talk about pollination method. And reading that in your garden has mostly to do with looking at the flowers. So it's a good excuse to look at flowers. Like, we need that, right? Uh, and then the next, uh, the, the last kind of way that we are going to talk about how we read the garden is whether something is annual, biennial, or in some cases, perennial. <clears throat> so, family. We've got tomatoes, eggplants, potatoes, and peppers. Those are all related, and they're in the Solanaceae family. Let's look at the legume family, beans, peas, fava beans. You save seeds from those three plants using exactly the same method. So I don't have to know the difference between them really. I don't have to look them up individually. They're in the same family. Knowing the family will also let you know a little bit about how pests or diseases might interact with your plants. Uh, for instance, things that are in the carrot, dill, parsley family are all susceptible to the same uh, kinds of pests. That can help you to know not just when it comes to seed saving, but how could I rotate crops through my garden and rotate by family so that I'm not planting the same thing in the same place year after year, time after time, and those diseases in the soil are just concentrating. So there we go. That's a little bit about the families. Um, it always surprises me and then doesn't surprise me when I find out something like beet, Swiss chard, and spinach are all in the same family. Hmm. I mean, they actually do kind of look similar now that I think about it, right? All right, so let's talk out a little bit about pollination method and flower type. Pollination method is something you need to know about for seed saving because it dictates how much cross-pollination you're going to have between different plants or between different members potentially of the same uh, species, but different varieties. So when we think about how 
the plants pollinate. Wind has a very small flower. It's really hard to see. Um, insect pollinated plants often have a landing pad and you can easily see all the parts of the plant because the plant is inviting the insect to interact with it. That's part of how this pollen is gonna move from place to place is with the insect. And then there are self-pollinating plants. And in this case, the flower creates a chamber so that usually by the time it's open, all of the parts that needed to mix in order to pollinate have already done their job. So what are these examples of? What kind of pollination do you think we're looking at here? We've got corn and spinach. And when you look, I mean, it's like, I know your screen might be kind of small, but you're like, where even is the flower on this? Hmm. These ones are pollinated by the wind. And as such, the plant doesn't put a ton of energy into making a flower that smells good to attract insects or is really colorful to attract insects. It's uh, these plants have a special relationship with the wind and their flowers are designed to just let that pollen why? So seed saving from these types of plants is very difficult. It's so hard to control the wind. I mean, isn't there a phrase, something like you can't, can't, you can't direct the wind? You can harness it, but you, you can't direct it. So in order to save seeds from these types of plants, people have to isolate them by very large distances as far as the wind might blow pollen. So I think with corn, it's uh, trying to get miles between one type of corn and another if you want to save exactly that type of corn seed. And you've seen this in the news as pollen from genetically modified corn has blown into other farmers' fields and then caused all kinds of legal issues. We cannot control the wind. Now, what I wanna point out about this is that even though these are wind pollinated and I'm saying they're the hardest to save seed from, it's still something that is worth trying. I started saving seeds from corn. You have to have at least 200 individuals, uh, individual plants to, to get good genetic integrity uh, for corn. And I learned a lot just by watching how those ears and cobs formed. And I saw how my corn cross pollinated with other corn that I couldn't even see because the kernels were a different color. Uh, like individual kernels would be a different color. I just, you know, even though it was hard and even though I didn't end up saving those seeds, I still tried it and learned something. And when it comes to spinach, there's not a ton of other things in the spinach family. So you're pretty okay to let the wind just pollinate without having to worry about too much crossing. I mean, do you know anyone else who has spinach flowering right now? Not, right, not too many. So just because it's the least controllable and maybe the most difficult to have uh, predictable results doesn't mean it's not worth trying. So, whoops. Here are our landing pads, right? So these are plants that are pollinated by insects. Um, and I'm just gonna say, do you recognize any of these flowers? Because you have eaten all of these plants. Anything look familiar there? You can say that. The Queen Anne lace there. So yeah, we're talking about this one right here, these two photos. This is carrot, but it is so closely related to Queen Anne's lace that when you save carrot seeds, it can cross pollinate through the insects visiting Queen Anne's lace and then visiting carrot and your carrot seed will no longer be orange, right? The carrots you save next uh, have that Queen Anne's lace genetics. They'll be white and not nearly as sweet. Now there's the potential that some insect might someday bring that grain of pollen that actually makes the carrot that is the best possible uh, combination of a domesticated carrot and Queen Anne's lace, but I haven't seen it yet. I've only seen sort of like my carrot size go downhill uh, when I have cross pollination, but very apt. I'm glad that you noticed that Queen Anne's lace and carrot are the same plant, just different varieties of that same species. Delicious. 
<laughs> you know, that yellow one with the B on it looks really familiar, but I can't place it. Yeah, yeah. And you know, this might be one that you've had in a salad. Sounds crazy, but uh, I feel like there's an interest right now in brassica flowers. This is uh, maybe broccoli. I, yes. The things in that family all look so similar to me. I'm actually not sure. Um, but yeah, they're delicious in a salad. If things go to flower and you say, oh, I lost my broccoli, uh, bolted, it's going to go to seed. You can eat the flowers too. But what I love about this picture is that you can see the bee's little feet hanging right. on to the structure of the flower. The flower is built so that a bee can grab the edges of the petals and stick his body in there and do all that pollination stuff. That's not an accident, right? The bees and these flowers have a really special relationship where over time they have grown to resemble one another and to support one another. Mm -hmm. Looks like a squash blossom on the bottom. Precisely, yep. Anything that's in that curcubit family, so squash, cucumbers, melons, they all have flowers that look like this. It's just like a big open door into a little cup, right? It's like this great big invitation to insects uh, come into this palace and wander around, right? I just love their flowers. Those are also edible. Um, and they're also, you know, from cucumber to cucumber, like if I was growing a cucumber called green finger, and I was also growing a cucumber called straight eight, they could cross pollinate. But if I was growing a cucumber right next to a squash, say a pumpkin, they're actually different species, so they wouldn't cross pollinate, right? So this is another way, like when you're planning your garden and you're trying to ask yourself, which ones should I save seeds from? It's those kinds of knowledge now that you can read your garden that can help you make this decision, right? I can save seeds from these cucumbers, even though they're in the same family as the pumpkins, they're not the same species. Does anybody know what this globular globe one is? That's green onion, isn't it? Yes, excellent, Jonathan. Yeah, yeah. This is an allium. So onions and garlic and these chives all have this round ball flower head. This is like, I think of it as a disco ball for insects. Like there's just so much going on there. Every little flower is so exciting that, you know, they want to get up in there and, and just travel and walk all over this landing pad and spread the pollen from flower to flower. All right, so those are insect pollinated plants. We can control this through isolation. And you're like, oh no, what are we talking about now? We just, <laughs> things were glittery and now they sound bad. Say I want to save seeds from my carrot plants and I don't want the Queen Anne's lace pollen getting in there. I'm not in the mood for an experiment. I wanna get the same carrot that I've been saving. Um, I'll show you about how to do this later, but I need to exclude insects from being able to come in and do this work. And then I need to find a way to do the work of pollination myself. We'll talk more about those methods later, but thinking about how do I seed save from plants and families that are insect pollinated? I don't want them to cross. It's creating physical barriers that exclude insects. All right, now, Let's talk about the self-pollinators. We've got some self-pollinating uh, examples of flowers right here. These are the easiest to save seed from because like the plant is taking care of everything. They're like a full service seed saving machine. They say, I am already ready. You don't even have to worry about it. Uh, and this serves the plant pretty well, right? They're not depending on as much chance from the wind or from insects, kind of taking care of it on their own. Um, do we recognize any, uh, either of the flowers that are here? Uh, pea, uh, pea plant? Yes. Um, hey, you're good at this. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, yeah, actually, yeah, you've gotten a lot of these. So the pea, you can see this kind of front area. I'm not sure what the real name is for this, but this is a, a chamber where the pistils and stamens are hidden. And by the time this flower is open, they've already mingled 
right? So there's no, or less, I should say, opportunity for wind or insects to cross. And other things that are in the pea family that would be very easy to save seeds from are beans. Um, peas and beans are two of my all time favorites. They're just so easy, so fun. And if you don't get out in the garden to pick the beans when they're like the perfect size, it's okay. You can just save those for seed and you don't have to do anything special. You let them stay on the plant and dry down and you don't even have to feel bad for you know letting them go and get too big, right? Because they're gonna be seeds for next year. What about this yellow one? This is a really close up picture of a tomato. Mm -hmm. So these are tomato blossoms. And here you can see that the when the petals open, they reveal this other kind of like chamber shape, right? Tomatoes are mostly self-pollinating, not entirely, um, but you don't have to isolate them very far from one another uh, <clears throat> in order to get seeds that are representative of the ones that you wanted to save. And uh, I mentioned Joseph Lofthouse earlier. He's actually interested in making tomatoes where the parts can cross-pollinate more because he says that tomatoes are some of the most, um, I'm gonna use the word, inbred or limited genetic plants that are part of our food system. Because if you think about it, tomato genetics traveled from the Andes in like South and Central America to Europe and then back. And only a few individuals have made this trip. So tomatoes are actually really genetically limited. And in the same way that uh, a purebred dog might have more congenital health issues than a mutt, this can happen when our breeding lines get too narrow. There are too few individuals in the breeding pool with plants as well. So that was kind of a tangent. Um, but these self-pollinating flowers are the ones that are really fun to start for saving seeds. Not everything in the Solanaceae family, uh, like tomatoes, is self-pollinating. Um, but you can look at the flower and kind of tell. So we've learned two of the kind of three ways to read your garden, by family and then by flower type. Let's look at the last one. This one has to do with your garden over time. How much time am I going to need to save seeds from this plant? And annual means that the plant dies every year and we have to plant new seeds every year. That plant basically has a one year life cycle. Uh, a biennial is a plant that has a two season life cycle. So we were talking about carrots earlier. Uh, in the first year, the carrot is this nice big root and a lot of fluffy feathery leaves, right? In year two, if I can successfully overwinter my carrot, the carrot is gonna send up a flower stalk that looks like Queen Anne's lace. And the root is actually gonna like shrivel up and put all of its energy into making flower and then seeds. Um, and I need to wait for that plant to complete its entire life cycle before I can save seeds from it, right? So how much time do I need to protect this plant in order to save seeds from it? Other examples of biennials other than carrots um, include cabbage, um, a lot of brassicas actually. And I'm not thinking of too many others off the top of my head, um, but you can see other examples of biennials like burdock is a biennial, first year big leafy rosette, second year flower stalk. Um, and then of course we got some, and I think that there is a great deal of interest in perennial food plants, those which come back year after year. Um, but I'm a little bit less knowledgeable about those. Uh, I, I know that, you know, there's nut trees, fruit trees, bushes, et cetera. So, all right, what are we gonna look at next? I think that sometimes people hear about seed saving and they think, oh, well, that's nice, but I don't think I could actually do that in my garden because, you know, I just have a little garden. 
like, you know, it's like 10 by 20 or even just in containers. And like, I, I just don't think that I have like seed savers exchange, like hundreds of acres to spread things out. Well, um, in order to address that, I came up with a, a couple ideas because I have a pretty small garden and I want to seed save. So here are your considerations when you're planning your garden for seed saving. You need to give enough time to your plants that they can mature fully during the growing season. We talked about beans, right? That's pretty familiar. Does anyone recognize this big yellow thing? Is that a squash? Almost. It's in the same family, but it's a cucumber, right? We usually eat plants before their seeds are mature because, well, that's when they taste good, right? This cucumber would be intolerably bitter and no one would probably want to eat it. It's got a really thick skin, but it needs to get this mature before the seeds are actually mature inside it. So when you think about cutting open a green cucumber and the seeds look maybe kind of translucent, those are seeds that are still developing. And uh, giving your plants enough time and knowing how mature they are when they are actually seed ripe, that is kind of a trick. Tomatoes and bell peppers are two that we can eat at the same time that their seeds are probably mature, like a dead ripe tomato and a ripe pepper both have seeds that we can just save. We don't have to let any of them go. But for the plants that do need more time, I will set aside 10 or 15% of my garden. So if I have, you know, 100 bean plants in a row, um, I'll leave 10 or 15 to just go to seed and I won't touch them at all. And that's how, you know, I'm still harvesting from the other plants, but I let some, I let some go. Um, oh boy. Another consideration for seed saving is selenium. A lot of soils in our area are deficient in selenium. Uh, and selenium is important to the seed as it is making its seed coat, which is its like tough outer skin. It's like its suitcase that protects all of its genetic information. Um, and so if you want seeds that are gonna last, as in how long will a seed that's been saved last? Well, in some cases, more than a thousand years, uh, they need selenium. Um, so uh, a way to get selenium uh, available to that plant so that it can incorporate it into its seed coat is by adding alfalfa meal that is from alfalfa from an area from this white zone, right, where they have adequate selenium in the soil that that plant can take up. Another thing that's important in seed saving is not too much nitrogen um, because that can encourage a lot of leaf growth but not a lot of flowering and thus seed production. All right. Another thing you want to consider in your seed saving garden is, is this plant part of a large enough population to maintain genetic integrity and avoid what's called inbreeding depression? Um, so uh, the plant on the left is experiencing inbreeding depression it is the result of having too few individuals in a population that needed cross-pollination or out-pollination in order to have uh, quality. So I was talking about the corn. I can't save seeds from five corn plants. Corn just needs more people in the pool, right? So uh, different plants have different uh, populations required to maintain genetic integrity. And those self-pollinating plants only need a few individuals, right? Because that's how they're designed. And that is another way that I like those plants for seed saving, is you don't need an entire field of them in order to get good results. Oops, <clears throat> having some issues with my computer, it is very slow. So another thing to consider if I'm gonna seed save is that I'm gonna need a little more space because in order to let plants get fully seed mature, they need more space and they also, their roots need more space because they need to be able to take up more nutrients in order to make those seeds. So this is a photograph of kale. Kale is a biennial. So this is kale in its second year. And you can see that things are planted a little bit too tight. They needed, these plants needed more space 
in order to uh, have adequate nutrition to produce their seeds. So, you know, when you want to seed save in your garden, you might need to dedicate a little bit of extra space to let that plant get bigger, to let that cucumber plant go all the way, right? So here's an example of a seed saving garden that I think is like 15 by five. I've got a blue Hubbard squash, pak choy, potatoes, kale, marigold, dry beans, nasturtium, basil, tomato, um, pole beans, and lettuce. These are all plants that can just kind of, you know, you don't need a lot of space, you don't need a huge population, and they're all easy to save seeds from. So I'm going to pause there <clears throat> and say, are there any questions at this point? It's been about an hour. If people need to take a break to go use the restroom or something, we can take a couple minutes for just maybe stretch. And, yeah. So uh, let's take three minutes. Let's come back at 12.03. At and if anyone has any questions, I'll just hang out here and you can ask. Jonathan, I think that this next section uh, might be maybe the most useful for you because we're going to talk about the conditions for seeds and seed storage, which is basically what the soil is, is a, is a seed bank, right? And so for your composting project, you're trying to figure out how, how do I, you know, keep the microbial life and the fungal stuff, but not have the weed seeds come along for the ride, right? I agree. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I didn't specifically join the Zoom call for that. However, when you kind of pop the question of why are you in the Zoom call, I felt like I need to give a professional answer in relation to where I was working. <laughs> um, Very professional. And I think it's an interesting question. It's really intriguing to me because uh, I have the same problems with my compost at home. You know, 
I don't turn it often enough and it, it doesn't get hot enough. And I right. wonder if there are other ways to uh, counsel people about the compost they receive so that you can say, you know, when you get this and you plant your plants, mulch over it with straw or something else so that the weed seeds don't pop up on you. Keep them in the bank. Don't, you know, let them cache themselves uh, when they're exposed to light and create all the weeding issues. Yeah, well, I'm help build the raised beds and, you know, we get a lot of people of various experience levels, you know, so it's, um, for me, I, I've never owned a raised bed myself. You know, I've worked on some in Colorado, but it was out on at like 8,000 feet. So, you know, not much of anything wanted to grow up there. Um, so I, it's for me to counsel them. It's like, I'm still experimenting with all of this myself. I feel like I'm fairly new to the whole agricultural atmosphere. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Totally. Yeah, wow. I actually have some questions about farming at that else student. I hope that uh, we run into each other at Partridge Creek sometime. We can talk about it more. I work with May, um, uh, and I think I'm going to be doing some work with you guys this fall, uh, hosting some community meetings for a grant, et cetera. So. Well, I look forward to it. Yeah, I, uh, I've been meaning to go and visit with you. I had originally, when I moved up here, it was because I had gone to Chatham a few times and I visited the farm and I had met with Paul Nas, um, yes. but it was in the middle of the winter. So like you were obviously not going to be at the farm at that point of the year. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to see that you are able to get out, out past, uh, you know, a foot of snow or yeah. several feet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool. All right. So let's talk, it seems like we're mostly back a little bit. I'm gonna cover this quickly and then we're gonna get into our kits. Uh, wet and dry seed saving. What, wet and dry? How could you wet save a seed? Well, this is gonna be about the conditions that we need to create for seeds through processing and storage in order to maintain them, maybe not just for a year so we can plant them next year, but for as long as we can for them to remain viable. So I think I start out with wet processing. Why wet seed saving? This is a photograph of a tomato whose seeds have sprouted while they're still in the tomato. What? Well, let's think about this from the seeds perspective. The inside of a fruit is dark and has adequate moisture and might even have a light, like a slightly higher temperature. This is actually an excellent place for a seed to germinate. And the plant has produced the fruit to give its seeds a little extra nutritional boost so that they can grow. So when you see this photo of the seeds that have sprouted inside the tomato, it makes sense from the seeds perspective, but we don't usually see this, right? This would be weird to cut open a tomato and find this. You'd be like, um, what is going on here? So tomato seeds have a protective coat. They've got their seed coat and then they've got this other layer, this gel that surrounds them. And if you've ever, you know, cut a tomato off on a cutting board and gone to wash the cutting board later and the seeds are just really sticking, it's that gel, right? And that gel around the tomato seed inhibits germination so that the seed can wait until the right season to sprout and take advantage of all the things about you know this fruit but wait not while we're still on the plant wait and so in order for us to save seeds from tomatoes which are easy to save seeds from and a very popular one um, we need to remove that coat that seed coat and the way we do it um, is through fermentation. Tomato seeds and cucumber seeds are really the only two that I do this with, um, but you basically take the seeds, uh, like I squeeze a tomato into a jar, add a little bit of water, do not uh, tightly seal the jar. You want to put something over it because fruit flies, uh, but something porous. Uh, you can see in this example that they've used a piece of paper and a rubber band. Um, 
after this white mold forms, then I know that this seed coat, the germination inhibiting seed coat is uh, digested, if you will, by the microbes in here. And I can rinse the seeds and then I spread them out on paper plates uh, to dry. And I label the paper plate with what tomato it was. Um, it doesn't smell great, not gonna lie. This is kind of a gross process, but it increases your tomato seed germination rates for the next year. For me, it changed it by 50%. So I got like a pretty significant increase in the number of seeds that germinated by following this method. Uh, and that got me actually to 100%. All of my seeds germinated by using this method. Yeah, question. What you mean by that is um, you had a 50% increase from doing this process rather than perhaps getting a seed from the seed library or buying a seed from the store. Is that what you're meaning? No, I mean that if I didn't do this fermentation process, only half of my seeds germinated from my own garden. Any seeds that you buy commercially have had this process done to them. Tomato seeds from the seed library, maybe, maybe not. We don't really have a way of tracking that. Um, I think most seed savers probably do, but maybe not everyone. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's talk now about dry process. This is how most seeds are saving from your seed kit. I only sent you the dry process ones. Uh, you gotta make sure that the seeds are mature right, that they're fully developed, that they've got their darkest color. Um, and as we talked about, that means leaving them on the plant as long as possible. And sometimes that's a race against the frost. Um, often a plant will try to finish out its seeds if it gets cold, uh, like it'll put all of its energy through its remaining cells to just finish those seeds. Um, but ideally we want the plant to be able to, you know, finish before the frost. I'm kind of interested in experimenting with plants that can, because uh, we do get a lot of frosts here. Anyway, um, one way that you can make sure that the seeds are dry after you've harvested them from the plant, I just put them in a paper bag and that paper bag is labeled with a Sharpie and I have just a, like a back porch full of paper bags. Um, you want, before you start to store the seeds to make sure that they're dry. So I use a, my teeth I use my body as the way to test this. And like if you were to bite into a sunflower seed, it should break or shatter, not tear, right? If the seed tears, uh, like think of pumpkin seed or something big and flat like that, if it tears, it's not really ready yet. And the more you do this with bigger seeds, the better you can get at doing it with smaller seeds. Like I can use this test for tomato seeds. Um, and I don't know of any seeds from our common garden plants that are poisonous because we eat them. But if you were going to try this test with other wild plants or, uh, you know, I don't know, I'd look it up, right? <laughs> Since you're putting them in your mouth. Uh, when you're seed saving from plants that take dry process, you don't want them to get rained on too much before you collect them because that's kind of that moisture is waking up the seed a little bit and decreasing its viability or its lifespan. Right. Um, I use different tools that, you know, you can buy all these things as like seed saving kit uh, things, you know, like specifically for seed saving. But I found that I need different sizes of screens, right? These have different size holes, not very different, but it's the difference between a carrot seed and a broccoli seed. So I can just put the seeds in these and swirl them around and the seeds fall out the bottom and the chaff stays on the top. If you've ever heard the phrase, you know, winnowing the seeds from the chaff, as a seed saver, you get to actually winnow seeds from chaff. Um, yeah, bowls of various sizes. Um, you can also use a fan or your breath to uh, blow the final chaff off of things. And the reason that you're trying to get the seeds clean like that, just seeds, is that the chaff is plant tissue that can have diseases and it can also introduce moisture and microbes and stuff that could eat the seeds or, uh, or compromise them while they are in storage. So you're trying to get just the seed in its perfect little seed suitcase without any of the other organic matter 
uh, that they are all bound up in. So I think it's time. I don't even care where I'm at. I'm tired of talking. Oh yeah, we're talking about uh, how long they can remain viable. Hundreds of years of stored under the right conditions. I use the little silica packets that come in like shoes or like medication. I'll stick that in with some of my seeds that I want to stay dry. Um, you want to keep them at a relatively stable temperature, big swings in temperature, like a garage, you know, where it gets really hot during the day and then really cold at night. That can be hard on the seeds viability because it wakes them up a little bit. They're like, oh, is it? No, oh, okay, we don't have any of the other conditions. Uh, so a stable temperature um, and dry, dark conditions are ideal for seed storage. <clears throat> All right, that was a, a quick and dirty version. You've learned how to read your garden for the plant families, the uh, types of pollination, and that, how that tells you what's gonna be easier to save seed from or harder, um, and also about how much time each plant needs in the garden. And you've also learned about some of the considerations for planning a garden for seed saving. You don't just think about it in the fall. You can start thinking about it in the spring and plan your garden around this idea that you want to seed save. Um, and yeah, then we looked at how we process different types of seeds. So this has been kind of a lot of information. And I recognize that you may have a lot of questions or you may be like, wow, I'm gonna need to try this. And then I'm gonna have a lot of questions. So I put together some kits. And if you'd like, if you have a kit and you wanna get it out and start playing with it, by all means, I'm gonna give you guys a little tour of the kit and uh, let you know what the different pieces are. So, of course, we've got literature, right? These are two different uh, things that the Queen City Seed Library had put out. Uh, one is the introduction to what is a seed library and how does this work? Uh, but it also has some cool information in addition to, you know, like our mission or whatever about getting your seed starting garden started. And it has a list of resources of different websites and different books that you could check out if you wanted to learn more. Um, so it's also got choosing seeds and it's got a list of ones that are really pretty easy. That's called start here. So that's beans, lettuce, peas, tomato, cilantro, dill, sunflower. There's kind of medium difficulty seed saving plants where you might need a little bit more knowledge in order to get results that are predictable. Uh, arugula, carrot, eggplant, cucumber, kale, onion, pepper, and then the with experience category, meaning that these are very likely to cross with other things that you're already growing. Beet, chard, corn, melon, pumpkin, squash, and spinach. So kind of some of the things we talked about are kind of in that list. They're also saving seeds in good company, which is a list of activities that you can do with kids or with one another, or if you get bored and you're like, what should I do? Uh, so different seed activities. And one of those seed activities that I included the materials for for you, this is a germination observation chamber. It may look like a small plastic bag with a cotton ball and string, but it is actually a way to observe a seed that is waking up. I like to use a big seed, like a bean seed. Uh, you wet the cotton ball, stick the seed against the wet cotton ball, put it in the bag and the string is so you can wear it around your neck if you would so desire, uh, or you can hang it up in a place where you're gonna see it all the time, like in a kitchen window. Um, and you can just watch that seed awaken. Um, some of the first things that you might notice if you were looking really, really closely with a bean seed is that it becomes wrinkly. The first thing that happens is the seed coat begins to loosen so that the suitcase can open up. So you can really look, uh, and, and I think a bean seed, it all depends on temperature, but in five to seven days, you would have something that you could observe there. And for people at home watching, since we're recording, it's basically a cotton ball, a piece of string, and the baggie with a hole punched in it, if they wanted to make their own. 
Yeah, and I'll give you a sneak preview of what you could be looking at here. And the reason that this activity is kind of cool is that it gets you ready for germination testing. Um, this is an example of a bean buddy from a Royal Burgundy bean. And this is the, these are the seeds that you have in your kit. Um, so you see here it is on the wet cotton ball. Here it is growing a root system and the cotyledons, it's first leaves and that's true leaves. Wow, you can really look closely at it and, and watch. And it eventually, you see how long it is? It's really stretching for light. It's like where all of the energy that goes to make this plant is contained in the seed, right? All of the tools it needs to begin its life is contained in the seed because there's no soil in here, right? It's pulling in through photosynthesis, carbon dioxide, and making its own structure. Kind of amazing how much is contained in a seed and how far a plant can get before it needs soil. To talk a little bit more about germination testing, when we look at this picture of these bean seeds on the left here, how do we know which one of these is still alive and viable? We actually can't tell just by looking. Seeds don't necessarily reveal whether they're still good or still alive or not. So germination testing helps us determine that. And we get a lot of seeds at the seed library that are maybe, um, you know, I'm wondering, did I do it right? Is it gonna work? Or their older seeds. Um, we ideally would like to germination test everything before we send it out, we generally don't. But the way that you do a germination test, if you wanna know, are my seeds viable, is you would take a certain number, maybe 20, um, lay them out on a wet paper towel, label it. And I also gave you some red romaine seeds in your kit. So if you wanted to do some germination testing, this is an important part of keeping seeds. Uh, I use a plastic bag method with the wet paper towel. You can also use like a Petri dish uh, if you don't want to do the plastic bags in your life. And you can see in this photograph, the very first hints that these lettuce seeds are germinating is that a radical is emerging. That little white tail Radical simply means by the root, right? So this is the first part of the plant to emerge and the lettuce seed is a part of the root. And then they eventually start growing and look like this. And you can count out of my 20 seeds if 10 germinated, wow, I've got a 50% germination rate. All the commercial seeds that you get have 90% or better. So if I was gonna try to use those seeds in my garden, now I know I need to sow them doubly thick. I need to put out twice as many seeds as I might've thought in order to get the same results that I, that I wanted. Um, so those are some uh, kind of germination activities. And I included three different kinds of seeds. You've got arugula, red romaine, and a royal burgundy bush bean. And I invite you to get a bowl. You don't have to do it right now. But when the time comes, if you'd like to do some seed processing, get a bowl and a sieve and play around with what it's like to process these different seeds. Um, I'm getting mustard seeds everywhere right now. Uh, the arugula is in the mustard family, the brassica family. And then there's three little envelopes in your kit. And you can, uh, labeling is very important. You notice I've given you the year and the type. So I don't always know the variety. The seed library is kind of vague sometimes. So, you know, if you want to process your arugula, and you can put it in this envelope and it's something that you can keep and store yourself that way or something you could share and trade with a friend. So the, for, for example, we have the kits, the arugula, wait, what do I got? I got the red romaine. We have these seeds. You're saying you can put some of them inside of here and label it and then do what with it, Abby? You can keep it yourself and plant it next year, or you can trade it with a friend. And you know the joy of processing these seeds is you'll get to tell the difference as you're trying to separate all of the chaff out as you're cleaning them. What is the difference between saving seeds from lettuce, which has a lot of chaff, 
right? They're wind pollinated and they're meant to fly in the wind and go everywhere versus beans where you just open up that pod and it's like there's jewels sitting inside. It's so much easier. And that might help you decide, well, I really like lettuce, but I'm willing to buy the seed because I don't like yeah. processing it. Beans, on the other hand, I would save seeds from all day because they're so easy and fun to process. Inside of the red romaine, for example, there's the flower and the stem. So that's part of the chaff, but there's these little tiny black seeds. That's the seed, right? But you have to get through it to get that. And that's what you put in the in here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The processing part. You didn't do it for us. We have to learn how to do it ourselves. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Yes, I, you know, I, I grew the plants and then uh, I think I mentioned I have a lot, a lot of the seed material, right? I have bags and bags of this stuff because the plants are so generous. They give us so many seeds and it can be really fun to do the process of processing the seeds, but there's some that I probably wouldn't grow again for seed because I didn't really like fussing around with it. I don't know. Everyone's different. Uh, some people I think really love the puzzle or the process of really taking apart those seeds and getting them very clean. So to each their own. Fun to actually find the seed. You know, it's like a treasure hunt. It's like, where is the seed? It's in there. <laughs> Which They're all a little is different. The actual seed. And you can try the tooth test on some of these smaller ones. The lettuce seed might be, you could try and see, is it really dry enough to store? So I have a question with the beans. Um, we, do, we grow beans and peas in our little raised bed gardens. Some of them, you know, they don't turn out. Are those the ones that you might wanna leave and just let them to save seeds from? Or do you wanna let the good ones, some of the good ones that you'd wanna pick stay? That is such a good question. Because, you know, you can read all these books. You can learn all this stuff. Your body is the ultimate tool for determining whether or not you should save seeds from something. And then what you want to save from is what looks delicious, what you like the taste of. So that, you know, if you save from the plants that didn't perform as well, that's what you're saving. And if you save seeds from the plants that are the best, then that's what you're saving. Realizing that the best is subjective and that, you know, my best and your best might be different plants. That's also part of our relationship with plants, how we are over time co-evolving. We're changing together. So uh, really good question. Save from the ones that appeal to you. And that is how you develop a relationship with your plants. Do folks have other questions? Uh, could be general gardening, could be seed saving, just things that you want to talk about either with me or with one another. Well, I appreciate the information about waiting until plants mature. Uh, I've never seen uh, a yellow cucumber, <laughs> but, and, and I would have probably thrown it away. Um, or the tomato that was sprouting, slice of tomato. That's good. <laughs> The whole well, I'm thing glad that there was some new info in there. I'm glad you learned something. <laughs> Abby, would you say that a part of seed saving is also like um, Emily had mentioned a kiwi? You know, I know people who sort of save the avocado or they'll save the onion. And is that also a form of seed saving? That's a really interesting question. I, I've actually I've been thinking about this too. So that's saving the individual. That's kind of more like cloning. So the avocado is seed saving, right? Because it's a seed. But if you're regrowing your celery or your green onions, you're just giving that plant a chance to continue growing. Um, one kind of seed saving that we didn't talk about much is potatoes or garlic, right? Garlic seed and potato seed are actually totally different. What we tend to plant when we plant potatoes, we plant potatoes, right? Well, potatoes make seeds too, and they are tiny. And potato breeders interact with those seeds from the potato flowers. But most of us consumers, farmers, etc., only interact with seed potatoes, which are actually just young potatoes, right? <laughs> we plant them in the ground and they mature for another year. And we say, oh, good. Now I've got the potatoes I want to harvest. Um, 
So there's that kind of, the question each of these techniques that we're talking about answer is, how do I keep my food, <laughs> right? How do I keep it from year to year or from moment to moment? Is that through regrowing it from it's, you know, a cut off piece of green onion or is that through keeping a potato or is that through saving a seed? Is anyone thinking about trying some seed saving in their garden this year? And if so, what kinds of plants might you be interested in? So when you guys all had your kits, I was thinking about it and I was like, oh, I do have some seeds pretty close to me because I've been saving all the seeds that I take out of these apples that I've been eating over the winter. And I threw them all in my freezer I've been meaning to go and throw them into some paper towel and uh, stick them onto my modem just so I can get them to warm up and see if anything germinates. Mm -hmm. um, but I went to school or when I was doing MSU during the COVID year, um, there was one of my classmates, he worked at an apple farm and it's so complicated working with fruits like actual trees versus just these annual plants. It's uh it's pretty daunting, um, but seems like a fun thing to mess with. That is a whole different ball of wax, right? Because most apple trees that we're familiar with are grafted, right? There's the rootstock and they take a branch from an apple tree that they know they like, like Fuji, and put it on the rootstock and the tree that grows and produces apples is genetically a different individual from the rootstock that is hardy enough to, to maintain. And apples right. have this fascinating approach to reproduction where their seeds never resemble their parents, right? They're heterozygous in the most incredible way. They always throw something different. And so when you save your apple seeds and you wanna plant some out and grow them, you are going to be experiencing the kaleidoscope of all kinds of different combinations, none of which probably look like the apple you ate in the first place. That is how new varieties are developed. That is how new varieties are found. Huh. Huh, huh is right. <laughs> I, I have a follow-up on that when we're talking about composting. Are there certain types of seeds that you don't want in your compost that you should be mindful of in terms of just a regular person eating food they're buying or making in their garden? Mm. Um, yeah, you take it. Well, I mean, the ones that I would struggle more with, I would be more worried about perennial or yard waste type of seeds. So things that are like invasive species for that specific area. So let's say somebody gives me a bag of leaves and it has yard waste with it. And then I have some creeping Charlies in there. So like those vines or like quack grass, quack grass is really bad. Um, these things that have really deep root systems, I'm not as worried about annual seeds because it's a tomato or a squash. So that'll just, you know, I can pull that out, no problem. But um, with some of these more perennials and harder to deal with seeds or plants rather, that's my larger concern. And realistically, the Compost should kill these seeds, but the problem is that if you have to cover these windrows with some sort of carbon, you usually use straw, and straw is really expensive. So, and really nobody wants to be pushing straw. You know, it's kind of like, oh, put it on there and then we're done. So, trying to go and get that balance, it's, um, it's interesting, not something I've really experienced prior to coming up here. You know, I realized uh, we're just talking now, there's one thing that I forgot to mention, which is which plants can you save seeds from? Mm -hmm. um, I think people look at a seed packet and if it says F1, that means that it's an F1 hybrid. This plant has two different parents and it may 
produce seed or it may be sterile. Um, you can save seeds from F1 hybrids, just like for instance, the sun gold tomato is an F1 hybrid. And when you save seeds from sun gold, you end up with one of the parents. And one of those parents is really tasty. They just breed in another tomato in order to make uh, sun gold more vigorous and disease resistant. Um, but the, what you're really looking for is the word open pollinated, right? Uh, there's heirloom, there's non-GMO, there's all of these terms. Open pollinated is the term that helps you know this plant will reproduce and give me seeds that look like its parents. It looks like what I'm familiar with. Um, there's also seeds that are licensed and owned as intellectual property. And uh, one is uh, cannot save seeds from those. Uh, but there are so many open pollinated varieties that it's, that's the word you're looking for, right? Open pollinated. Sometimes it's on the seed packet. Sometimes you have to look it up online. Uh, seed Savers Exchange has a great website. And if a packet you do buy from the store, if it says a sell by, and it's expired, do you just not use it anymore usually? Or do you do a, do a germination test? If it's a packet and there might not be enough seeds for a germination test, right? If I, am I gonna take out 20 seeds if I only have, you know, 25 in there? Depends on the packet. Um, I would germ test it or I would plant it double and just seed more heavily and hope that things come up. Um, different seeds have different viability rates uh, seems like the bigger and more meaty and tender a seed, uh, the shorter time they last. I don't know. Onions, for instance, really only have viability of a year. Uh, I don't save onion seeds because I want to leave that to the pros, uh, and they're really only good for a year. Um, whereas uh, something like, you know, cilantro seems to last forever. So just to reiterate, if somebody doesn't have this, um, a good place to start, Abby, that you've mentioned with saving seeds would be beans, lettuce, peas, tomato, cilantro, dill, and sunflower. Sounds like it's a good beginner place, since we're beginners here, to start to play around with saving seeds. Yeah, I would completely support and encourage anyone to give it a try. Um, even if it just means cutting a head off a sunflower or, you know, if you have a favorite tomato that is performing really well in your garden this year, just try it with just one. Um, just give it a shot. Let, let yourself off the hook when some of those beans go unpicked and just say, okay, those are for seed. I have one more question for you before we wrap up. Sure. Um, there's a lot of talk about food foresting or agroforestry, which is really allowing, you know, your forest or your landscape to produce the food for you. A little different than a garden because you're spending a lot of time in the garden, you're maintaining it. A food forest really should be something that's um, generating on its own or uh, without, for people like me that don't, my husband does the gardening. I'm like, just put it there, plant it, and allow nature to do what it needs to do. In terms of food foresting, um, do you ever have to be concerned about the self, the pollinating? Or is that just, it's an interesting question that you might not have an answer to, but now that I'm learning about the different ways of pollinating and spreading seed, if you're trying to develop something on your yard or in your forest where you want it to just naturally exist, mm -hmm. um, are there any, tips on save, uh, saving seeds within a food forest or being mindful of how you plant things there. Yeah, you're talking about generating a self-sustaining system, right? Right. So for annual plants that you want to come back from year to year, they need to drop their seeds in that area, right? So that their seeds sprout and you don't even kind of do the saving part. You just kind of let that system uh, work on its own. So in choosing the plants that would go into that system, they have to be able to uh, withstand the winter. The seeds cannot be so temperature sensitive, right? Eggplants, for instance, might be a tough choice for a food forest because their seeds die if they freeze. 
whereas other plants uh, need a period of what's called vernalization or freezing in order to sprout. So I guess, you know, it goes into selecting those varieties of what should be included there. Um, even if it's not, and I, and I guess I, I point this out as being maybe interesting or different because when I think of food forest, I think of perennials over and over of the trees, of the nuts, of the fruits, of the shrubs. And the way you just described it, Lanny, actually changed my thinking about what is a food forest. It could include annual plants that self seed and reseed themselves and come back every year. And it kind of takes you out of the seed saving equation in a wonderful way, right? That's actually really, really a cool idea. Make sure Lanny gets the credit for that. Yeah, right. <laughs> like I, permaculture hasn't already come up with that idea, I'm sure. <laughs> Are there any other questions, especially from Emily before we close? No, I am gonna try some beans and peas this year, I think. Um, this has been amazing. Thank you so much, Abby. Oh, that is so cool. I would like to thank you all. Thank you so much for inviting me and for adapting to doing it on Zoom. Um, I hope that we might have the opportunity to do something in person together at some point, maybe this fall, if someone's got something going on in their garden and they want to do some seed saving in place. Uh, oh, as long as the rules permit, I would be happy to set something up with you guys. We appreciate you collaborating with us, our group, UP Wild, for those that might not know. We just foster these opportunities to get to know the simplest things in life again and reclaim this, this knowledge. And we're really thankful that you shared your time with us, Abby, because you have so much knowledge to impart. And I was thinking when you're talking, you mentioned the mustard seed. And we are very familiar with this parable of the mustard seed. If you have the smallest amount of faith, right? But we've forgotten what a mustard seed really is, that it's actually a plant, it develops into something and it has medicinal properties. And so what we're really trying to do together as a, as a faith community is remember those things and then live out and practice those. So we thank you for, for this so much. Thank you. Have a really, really good gardening season. I wish you all the best. I'm gonna stop recording. <laughs>